Senator Price, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me, Sarah. Now, you've spoken openly about the trauma members of your family experienced, especially in the town camps in Alice Springs and especially women and children. For those people unfamiliar with your personal story, can you just tell us a bit of what you experienced? Well, I spent a lot of time uh, engaged with growing up, spending time in town camps. Uh, one town camp in particular in Alice Springs where I, um, where just before Christmas, my, my cousin, who's just a year older than myself, lived all her life. And at the age of 42, um, she died two days after Christmas due to, um, you know, terrible health conditions that I believe were brought on from a life living in a town camp, witnessing her father, my uncle, die um, because of alcohol consumption. His brother, my other uncle, also died from alcohol consumption. These are men that I loved, that were good men, but who were addicted uh, and suffering from alcohol abuse. Another of my aunt was stabbed and killed in a town camp. Uh, when my aunt and uncle were alive and, and, and um, involved uh, in a lot of the, the breakout and of violence in the town camp, I had to swoop in and with my parents, I think I was about 12, rescue my one and a half year old cousin. And I just remember him being distraught as a one and a half year old and me just wanting to soothe him um, and keeping him in bed with me that night. I just wanted him to be able to feel safe and you know, it's, it's these experiences and you know, also the experiences of having to ID my own cousin's body in a morgue after being killed in an alcohol fueled crash. You know, the, it goes on and on so, and on. And this is what I've grown up with. So let me ask you this. How much has all of this influenced the direction that you have taken and are now taking? This has influenced the direction that I've taken for some time in trying to fight on behalf of those vulnerable people in those town camps, the measures that I've been calling for, um, the bill that I've been preparing since August, which is pretty much a carbon copy of what now the Territory Government um, claims they are, they are going to apply. Uh, this is all about attempting to create safer communities for those people that I love. I know it's not um, a measure that's going to be a silver bullet. There needs to be a raft of measures, mm -hmm. but I want to save lives. This is why I'm here in federal parliament. So the Northern Territory government has announced new legislation to tackle the crisis. Um, in a, it's rejected any new federal laws. Do you trust the Northern Territory government <laughs> now to manage this crisis? The word trust and, and uh, the territory government in the same sentence just don't go right now. There, you know, Territorians, locals in Central Australia and in Alice Springs don't trust this territory government because we have seen failure after failure and their inability to listen to the community uh, when we've been calling out for months, um, stating that we're terrified of the fact that we, we knew that removing the cashless debit card as well as lifting the Stronger Futures legislation and to would be, lead just to, to this. Just to explain to our audience, that's the legislation introduced under the Gillard government. But let me ask you this. They've made it clear and the federal government obviously doesn't want to be part of another top-down intervention style approach. Is there any reason now why the Northern Territory government can't get this right? Absolutely, because they've demonstrated that they can't get it right. They denied right up until the last point that this was a measure that needed to take place because no matter how much money you throw at this situation, it's not going to work if it's just a, a, a Band-Aid solution, which is what they're attempting to suggest that they're going to do with $250 million. Um, splash that around uh, and, and reintroduce these, these bans. Do you, do you My, welcome that $250 million nonetheless? Look, I'm, I'm very concerned that it's not going to, to be applied, that there aren't going to be, um, that there's not going to be held accountable to those who will receive that money, uh, that there won't, there won't be any strings attached for that. I think this is why, from, my, from the federal perspective, my bill that I introduce is about a partnership of taking responsibility on a federal level and with the Territory Government, not just the federal government handballing this over for the Territory Government to fail us once more. Let's Let's just go on to the voice then, because obviously this feeds directly into that. If the majority of Indigenous people, as was polled at the beginning of the year, or at least many Indigenous people, see the voice as a means to giving them better design of laws and policies to protect them, 
and a majority of non-Indigenous people appear to support that from today's poll. Why would you want to stand in the way of that? Because we don't need a voice, we need ears. We need, we need our leadership to, have, um, to use their ears and to listen to community. If anything, the situation is in Alice Springs has demonstrated the fact that no matter who's trying to talk to the government, those in power, uh, to, to actually implement common sense solutions, they're not in fact listening. So I don't see how this is going to be uh, any different that this new uh, bureaucracy inserted in our constitution that well, will be correct driven you by there. those. The, uh, let's just talk about that bureaucracy because you've, you've laid out the case for why you're opposing, opposing the, uh, the voice. And I'll quote from the manifesto that you co-wrote. So this is one of the scenarios that you paint. Imagine a future Labour Greens opposition wishing to block coalition legislation. It would run to the voice and have it hold up legislation. But isn't it clear that the body that the government is proposing is an advisory one with no power to block legislation? No, it's not clear. Um, I don't think that's clear enough. I don't think there's enough detail to suggest that is clear. And I would also suggest that uh, as Indigenous Australians, we're some of the most overgoverned people in the country. We have so many gatekeepers on so many different levels. I see this as another form of gatekeeping. And most certainly, I see it as an opportunity for a Labor Greens government to ba be able to um, control uh, because that's, that's what they do in a lot of these Aboriginal organisations well, let, to let's, suit their narrative. Let's just, let's just go to what you said then. You said that it's not clear, but in fact, the proposed language of The Voice is clear. It says that The Voice may make legislation, uh, representation, I beg your pardon, may make representation. There's nothing there that compels future governments to follow or abide by that representation, is there? Yeah, but how that representation is implemented is still completely um, in muddy waters as far as I'm concerned. And if the, the government is suggesting that, you know, the parliament of the day the, uh, are going to determine how this voice looks, then I, I see it as providing an opportunity to be a Trojan horse. Uh, we know that this current Labor government can push through any sort of legislation that they want. And, and if they think it's going to be the answer to everything, why haven't they legislated it right now? It isn't, isn't that what's being debated? at the moment, the, the principle at least to begin with, that the voice is supposed to make representation, that it may make representation. Now, if you were reassured that that is indeed the language and that is the concept of the voice, would you remove your objection to it? Look, I think the High Court could make any determination if those proponents of the voice were not happy um, that their representation was not adhered to or listened to or heard in any way, shape or form, then they could certainly use the High Court um, to be able to push that upon um, the Parliament. And I just see it as opening a can of worms. Um, I just, want to, I just want to come back to that question of the High Court because former Chief Justice Robert French um, and, and Justice Hayne as well er, earlier on said that um, for the voice to have the powers that you're claiming, Parliament, that is Parliament, the body that you are part of, Parliament would have to grant them. Parliament, and I quote uh, Justice French, can't be compelled by the voice to make laws, nor can the voice prevent, be, pre be prevented from Parliament repealing laws. This is from a former Chief Justice. That's a pretty strong authority. Do you disagree with him? Absolutely, I do. <laughs> um, and, and I think there's evidence to su suggest that you could disagree with that, but there's also the just, fact just that... Just share that evidence with us, if you would, because it's two, two eminent legal scholars have said that well, what you well, are describing it, could not be part of the process of the voice. It, it exists within the Constitution. What's there to say that proponents of the voice cannot challenge that in the High Court? What, what, what is there, what evidence is there to suggest that that cannot be challenged? Absolutely not within the High Court. I mean, you know, we've seen High Court challenges take place before with, with the Love case, with determining as to, you know, the citizenship of Indigenous Australians, whether they, if they, you know, were born, if, they, if they've got Indigenous heritage in them, but they're from another country, that they can not be cast out of our country should they actually, you know, um, commit a crime. I mean, if we leave everything up to High Court judges, 
They can be swayed by, by the feeling of the time, whatever political persuasion that they feel aligned with at the time, and we've seen that happen in the past. Let's, let's move on to some other questions. You also state categorically in your manifesto that Aboriginal Australians don't need more voices. But don't the ongoing problems in Alice Springs and in other parts of the country, those entrenched, the entrenched disadvantage that you were talking about earlier on in education and in health and housing, employment, some of the things we saw in Carly's report earlier, don't they suggest that Indigenous Australians very precisely need the stronger voice that the Uluru Dialogues put forward? No, I don't believe that they need what the Uluru Dialogues put forward because there's a lot of Aboriginal Australians who didn't agree with the Uluru Dialogue. There are 250 individual signatures on that Uluru Dialogue and there are groups of people who quite clearly stated that they didn't support that dialogue, but this is what is being now um, bought by the Australian people as representative of all Indigenous Australians, which is utterly wrong. I mean, the other element of the voice is the fact that it suggests we're forever going to be living in disadvantage. That's not, ultimately, the result that we want is for Indigenous Australians to be able to have the same opportunities as everybody else and not requiring, um, you know, a, a change in our constitution, really. That's, that's what we want to aim for. That, that's ultimately what closing the gap looks like. But this voice mechanism doesn't speak to that at all. It just suggests we're forever going to be disadvantaged and we need this change in our constitution for that to happen. But the, the decades of disadvantage that those people in the story and many people that you know in Alice Springs, including your own mother, asserted that mm. we've seen decades of failure. The, proponent, the proposal of The Voice is to change that. Do you not find some sympathy with the idea that a new approach and a voice to the Australian Parliament is the route to make well, that it can't change? Be it can't be guaranteed and it certainly can't be demonstrated that this is the ultimate um, be all and end all. And speaking of my mother, um, the very reason why she decided to put her hand up and run for a country Liberal Party seat in the Territory was because of the fact that she was appointed by the then uh, Deputy Chief Minister, Marion Scrimgeour, to be the chair of the Indigenous Advisory Body to the then Henderson Government and found that her voice wasn't being heard there. So she took the democratic route to be an elected representative, just like the 11 of us that now sit in federal parliament to represent um, what the views are, certainly from our constituents, who include some of our most marginalised. That's the democratic process. It's up to us to actually uh, heed those voices that currently exist. And I don't know why suddenly the voice to parliament is the only way that any parliament is going to listen and to those voices that just, are loud and clear already. And just quickly, your party, the CLP, um, do they hold the same position as you that they are going to oppose the voice? I think you'll find in the coming weeks that that's exactly what the position that I will hold. Uh, Senator Price, thank you very much indeed for joining the program. Thanks for having me.